Good morning, folks. Earlier this year, we purchased an Okuma MB4000 horizontal CNC machining center with a six pallet pool APC. So it's been an awesome machine. I knew when we were getting started, we just needed to order three different tombstones so that we could get some of the key products that we wanted online uh, and really just move them over from verticals. And really that was a great way to go because the machine has been productive, but we needed to add more tombstones and we ended up making our own. And at first I kind of thought, hey, you got a lot on your plate. Don't go try to make tombstones, don't get cute. But the comments and the feedback from folks actually were very supportive. Uh, and apparently this happens quite a bit. So I wanna walk through that process, what we did really well and what I would do differently next time. You don't have to make a tombstone. They're readily available. Lots of folks sell them. The three sizes and shapes that we bought, uh, the first one was kind of a traditional T-style or slab style where most of your surface area is on opposing faces. Uh, although we are actually able to make use of the shorter kind of five or six inch ends of that. We have a six sided tombstone and we have a pretty traditional four sided square tombstone. But the two real reasons that pushed us to the DIY route here were, number one, most of the tombstones that you see are made of cast iron. And cast iron is great for its mechanical properties, the cost, the, the uh, vibration dampening, but it is miserable to machine. It makes an absolute mess. More importantly, we wanted the faces of this tombstone to be slightly proud of the Okuma pallet base, and that would allow us to use a face mill to get a little bit more Y travel or Y access to this part. It's a relatively simple design. We've got the four sides. We then used half 13 fasteners to serve as anchors to help increase the rigidity and the connection between the epoxy pour and the aluminum tombstone plates. We have a lid at the top, which also functions as a way to help maintain the alignment with this lip below it. And we have the base itself. And we use some extra one, two, three blocks that we trim down to function as cleats to hold the base to the side. The cutouts in the four corners allowed us to use off the shelf PVC. This kept the epoxy out of those areas where we used all thread to help secure the whole system down to the Akuma pallet base. And we used a 10 inch concrete form tube in the center to minimize the weight and the cure time of the overall build, but really uh, to minimize the amount of epoxy that we had to use. We bought this three gallon kit off of Amazon for about $250. And when we mixed it with the aggregate and the sand, that was just enough for this project. If you aren't familiar with what epoxy granite or mineral granite type casting is, I definitely recommend this video from Adam Bender on building an epoxy granite machine base. Adam did an absolutely great job talking about what epoxy granite is and showing some different prototype and testing he did with the advantages and disadvantages of each of those recipe blends. We had a little bit of an advantage with this build because first off, we didn't really care about the look of the epoxy granite. And it does matter when it's the exposed feature of the CNC machine, but for us, it, all the features are hidden. I also wasn't worried about minor voids because we knew there were folks out there that have built either aluminum style uh, fastening or weldments or other steel style tombstones. So in an unscientific way, I was pretty comfortable that this was going to be up for the task at hand. The other advantages, we're already set up to make pretty large quantities of flat plates uh, with our fixture plate line. So for us to make the four sides and the top and the bottom was really no additional work. And in fact, we had most of that material already on hand. We use some RTV silicone around the PVC and the concrete form. And this really only matters for the actual pour to minimize the amount of epoxy that seeps out through any cracks. And we had heard that Keith Rucker had a pretty catastrophic fail when he was trying a similar project using a concrete form with true concrete. Uh, the form failed on him. And because of that, we ended up stuffing our form with, with pool noodles to help give it some internal support. I tried the great stuff expanding insulation foam, terrible idea. In the end, we, we wouldn't have needed this. The epoxy wasn't as wet or as heavy uh, as the concrete. So next time I wouldn't worry about supporting it. Although for a dollar per pool noodle is a pretty inexpensive insurance policy. We then mix up this epoxy. It is a low exotherm style epoxy. So be conscious of that. If you're doing this sort of a project on your own, you don't want the heat to either be trapped or to build up so much that it causes an issue. And there's one thing I learned while we were trying to minimize the amount of void and area that we had to fill, it, it was almost too tight of an area. So some combination of a slightly smaller form or even removing the top row of fasteners would have made it a little bit easier, but by no means did this rule in the project just made it a little bit more tedious. We didn't have the ability to use any sort of a vibrating or shake table 
it's great to use it if you can, but we're not, we were not as worried about a true quote unquote perfect fill with any voids or bubbles, etc. And we use some clear tape. I think this is actually powder coat style tape just to kind of protect some of the edges that we wanted to keep clean. In this case, because the lid actually functions as a way of help maintaining the alignment between the whole system. Uh, so a strap clamp squeezing this system against the base and the lid helped meet our goal of keeping the sides perpendicular to each other and to the base to minimize the amount of cleanup machining we had to do once it was installed in the machine. After we got it loaded in the horizontal, I threw an indicator on there. I dialed it in kind of like a four jaw chuck to see how close I could get one of the faces. And the faces as traveling along the X dimension, that's left to right, were well under 10 thousandths of an inch. Uh, where we didn't do as well as I had hoped was in the Y axis, so that's up to down here. It was about 25 thou out. Now, not bad given that these are 26 inch long plates and no big deal to clean that up when we machine it, but I think we could do that part a little better next time. The one big lesson learned was how we are securing the tombstone to the Okuma provided base. I'll explain my thinking, not to defend it, but simply to show you guys where I was coming from. The other tombstones that we have use four cap screws to secure the flange on the base of the cast iron to the Okuma pallet base. Pretty common and frankly, not all that different from how we secure most of our work holding. If you're securing a vise to a T-slot or a fixture plate, usually we use something like four strap clamps or four screws to pull that vise down. So when I was thinking about this tombstone, which weighs, I think it weighs about 350, 400 pounds, using four pieces of all thread through the four corners and being able to secure that down, I thought it might be adequate, but it wasn't. It moved on us right when we started drilling it. And so what we had to do was add these two precision alignment bores in the aluminum side. And then we purchased these McMaster car pins that we threaded into the base. And that provided our XY stability and the all thread now doesn't have to do the alignment so much as it just has to keep it held down, uh, which it is able to do without problem. And finally, we used a five inch face mill to deck the sides to get them perpendicular and true to the spindle face. And this is the other, I don't know if this is a mistake, but it was certainly an oversight uh, and I'm embarrassed to admit it. Uh, the reason we wanted this style tombstone was that it allowed us to put a fixture on it and have access to bring a face mill in for our parts and clear the cast iron base of the tombstone itself. And this really gets you some extra room, if you will, because our Akuma, the y-axis travel ends something like 100 thou below the point right there. So without doing this, you've got some area that you're not able to use. And every 50 thou of y travel matters for some of the parts that we're making. After we installed this tombstone and we knew we needed a deck it, we don't have tooling that can reach it because the bottom part extends below what we need. Stepping up to a five inch face mill is no joke. We needed that extra radius so that we could reach further in Y, even though we didn't have the actual Y travel limit to clean it up. Once we decked it with that tool, went great. We're using our own fixtures on top of this tombstone. Uh, that minimizes the amount of holes and work we have to do. That hopefully means we can increase the longevity by having different products that come on and off it as needed. Uh, and it works great. And would I do it again? Yes, uh, it was relatively inexpensive. You know, aluminum prices shot up right when we were doing this. So I think the aluminum alone was about $800. Uh, that would have been as cheap as say four or $500 prior to the recent spike. Um, so the epoxy about $250, definitely some time in the pouring and installing the fasters and so forth. But nevertheless, you're looking at a true custom size of tombstone. It's aluminum and not cast iron for something like a quarter to half the cost of a uh, cast iron tombstone. So as always folks, hope you learned something. Hope you enjoyed. Take care. See you soon.